God damn it. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. Okay, how's that? That's awesome. That works. <laughs> so, is this your is this your little secret uh, getaway? <laughs> oh, you got a pool table. Sweet. Of course, you got a pool table. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Are those all uh, pool trophies? Yeah. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. Best of the season. Everyone best of the season. All this stuff. Man, that's a lot. Yeah. Deck cats. Dude, that's awesome. <laughs> what the heck? Wait, that you said dead cats. Where did you get yeah. that from? <laughs> you know, surprisingly enough, uh, eBay. You get lots of money on eBay. You just have dead cats. Oh my gosh, that is so weird, man. They're mummified. Yeah. <laughs> that one. That one's definitely Egyptian. Yeah, you can tell. Yeah. I got one. I got. Oh, here's a couple more. <laughs> well, that is so weird, man. I got I'm another def- one. I got this one in Denmark. I'm definitely this keeping this cool. one. <laughs> this one. <laughs> This one's like he's sleeping. Well, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, he died in the window and uh, <laughs> and sat in his window dead for decades. Oh my gosh. So, <laughs> I'm just gonna, I'm gonna intro because this is so awesome. Um, yeah. hey, hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Face the Truth. Um, I am talking to my buddy Ben and uh, he's an amazing artist. He's a tattoo artist. He owns and runs Deluxe Tattoo in Chicago. It's like the best place in the city for Chicago uh, to get tattoos. I've gotten like most of my tattoos there, I believe. Um, anyways, everyone, please welcome Ben Bois. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for doing this, man. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's uh, ho- hopefully I, I, I sound okay, and you can hear me. My uh, my setup's kind of messed up right now because my computer's still being fixed. So yeah, I'm, I'm good. Okay, cool. So uh, how you been, man, with, with your uh, dead cats? <laughs> Hello. That's I'm so just crazy. Sleeping. I'm just sleeping on Ben's lap. <laughs> That's so funny, man. Uh, really good. It's it's amazingly busy right now, believe it or not. I feel a lot of people are sitting home with extra money and uh, getting paid not to work. So yeah, it's really busy. so people have been coming in. Um, oh yeah, we're swamped. That's good. Yeah, I'm planning on coming in soon actually to get my right my right hand done. Cool. Uh, Bunny did the left hand a couple years yeah. ago. I'm gonna have him do something matching my right hand. Cool. Um, but um, so you know what? We've known each other for. A long time man i think i think the first time i went into your shop was like i think it was 2007 maybe something like that wow yeah we're coming up on uh, april 25th it'll be 24 years of being in business yeah. it's crazy man and uh ever since i never i never stopped coming back and and uh but i never you know one thing i always enjoy about going to the shop and hanging out with you is that you've got so many stories you know so many artists and you know Like every time I come in there, you got like some story about, hey, did you hear this about this artist or this or that or whatever? And you've turned me on to so many different artists that I never even heard of before. Um, But I never really, you know, we never really got into into how you even got into doing what you do in the first place. So I'm curious about you just as an artist in general, how did you end up getting into tattooing? Um, And Uh, then, uh, yeah, good. I, I, uh, I grew up into comic books comic books were like the first i guess art thing i really got into when i was a kid and i ended up working at a comic book store like 13 um 
having full access to all the great stuff, the undergrounds, you know, the Robert Crumbs, the Charles Burns, yeah. you know, all the great stuff that really inspired me. And, you know, I really loved uh, the textures, the ink work, the cross hatching. You know, I was the kid who bought the $20 Rapidiograph set and sat there with all the little different types, you know. Yeah, yeah. Work on that crumb cross hatching. <laughs> so, and the Marvel stuff, you know, I had a lot of good artists too, you know, your uh, Bernie Wrightstons, your John Burns, um, people that did really beautiful art also. But the underground stuff and black and white, you know, the, um, I think the most, impactful on me it was uh spiegelman's raw raw was man mm. number eight raw that that was the one that was just so uh powerful you know there's a few in there that are really dark and you don't see that with a lot of marvel comics you know where the um it's just so black and white and so stark and dark yeah you know, really emotional stuff really good but anyway that's the stuff that really grabbed me and like made me want to do comic books um Cummins comes into the picture later about when I was 17 or 18, a guy named Nick Wiggins. Nick was a tattoo artist, self-taught from the Danville, Illinois area. And he was also in comic books. And we had met because uh, we had a mutual friend and then he met my brother and tattooed him. And this was, like I said, I was about 17 at the time. And Nick was really in comics also. And Nick had, was trying to do comic book work also. Um, and I was with him at a comic book convention when he was trying to talk to some publishers. And what I was hearing out of these publishers totally turned me off to want to do comics, which was um, uh, they want you to neuter your work. They want to vary mm -hmm. the way they want it. Yeah. You know, growing up and seeing like Bill Sinkovitz, you know, his Electra, and seeing these, you know, awesome artists who are just doing beautiful work and hearing like, oh, those guys, yeah. Yeah, you're not going to be those guys. You're going to draw, you know, your ethnic people not looking too ethnic. You know, <laughs> looking very, you know what I'm saying? Like everything has yeah. to be here yeah. the way they want it. And they literally would say that. They literally would say that. And I mean, I get it. It's their company. They can do what they want to do. Yeah. But hearing it worded the way I heard it and... Uh-oh. You're frozen. Oh, no. So, now I was left in a weird position because growing up, this is what I was really gunning for and what I wanted to do. And I was like, well, no, I don't want to do that. So um, my parents were both uh, worked for the public school system. So I was going to college to be an art teacher. If you're going to be a teacher, make me an art teacher. And um, it just got, when you get later and higher up in the education level, it becomes more like, hey, go to this lecture hall and listen to this guy. And then go to this classroom and have a student teacher that doesn't want to teach, who's not even trying to be a teacher, but has to do this to get his degree. And it's just, it's a terrible system. You yeah. know, um, my one teacher was uh, uh, sociology, it was Japan and China. So the first uh, paper was on China. Listen to his lectures, write the paper according to what he says. Well, I have a friend who has a friend that's got back from living in China for five years. And they have a welcome home party. I'm talking to this guy. I tell him about this class. And he, he's very, I tell him uh, the paper is actually from my semester end is in the car. He wants to read it. I give it to him. He is laughing. He says this stuff couldn't be more wrong. He's like, this hasn't been legal for five years. This has never been legal. This never <laughs> happened. All this stuff this guy's teaching us in class is totally outdated and crap. Yeah. So, well, normally I'm on all A's and B's. I'm on the president's list at college. I'm doing very good. I talk to this guy on Monday in class, after class. He loses his shit on me. This is my class. You don't like it. You know, get out. But, but okay. I turn the paper and I don't change anything. F. <laughs> and I'm just like, what? So I go meet with the chancellor's office and they say, listen, these guys get their tenure. We can't tell them what to teach. We'll give you your money back and lay out of the class. And I'm like, you know what? Give me all my money back. I'm out of here. School at that point was not even possible. You yeah. know, and I mean, I get it now. You jump through their hoops. You get their piece of paper. You can make people jump through your hoops, et yeah. cetera. But what a miserable, horrible, horrible thing that like at that age, you should be living life. You should be young, happy, you know, positivity. 
doing yeah. great things, growing, learning what you want to learn and being awesome. Instead, you are sitting in the cinder block room with a miserable teacher who doesn't want to teach, <laughs> taking a class that you don't want to take, but it's part of your degree to make you a better person and building up student debt, which is going to crush you. It's a miserable yeah, 100%. Person. I, I fucking hate it. And um, Nick had offered to help me learn to tattoo. And so I said, hey, guess what? <laughs> I turned it down initially because initially tattooing to me growing up on the South Side was biker tattoo parties, you know, um, drugs, cigarettes, stinky people I don't want to be around, yeah. getting stupid tattoos that's what I do. Mm -hmm. um, so when I got into tattooing, it was more of like, a, I guess I'll try this than I wanted to do it. But once you get involved with it and you start doing it, um, especially back then, it was not as busy as it is now. And you are extremely, hopefully, you are extremely grateful for the opportunities you get. Meaning that, hey, I would never have thought I'd want to tattoo some stinky, smelly person doing a big Harley Rose on them. Yeah. <laughs> but once you start tattooing, guess what? You know, thank you. Thank you for letting me be the one to do this for you. And I'm going to do the best I could do because I'm honored that I get to do this on you forever. So yeah. you kind of learn to like, maybe not judge people so harshly and maybe just take these opportunities and appreciate them. And by doing so, you get return business. And if you treat people well, and you do good work that could lead to more work and it could yeah. lead to really good opportunities. So yeah, maybe this guy comes in and wants something that seems, you know, small and insignificant and to him it might mean son. So, Hey, you do it, but yeah. you do a good <laughs> job. Maybe he comes back and wants a full sleeve. Maybe he comes back and wants another piece, you know? So you learn to respect your opportunities. Yeah. So man, so how old were you when you started doing it? I mean, that was like, like 20. So 20? I was like, okay. Three. Yeah. And when you, uh, so when you started getting into it, you said it was like way slower. I remember when I first got tattooed, uh, was probably like 97 or 98. And, um, and, uh, it was, uh, Tim, Tim and James Kern did my first couple yeah. tattoos. Um, and, um, it was, it was weird because at that time in Chicago, like I only had a couple tattoos that showed like just barely under my sleeve. If I wore a short sleeve, you could see like something sticking out because um, I got them kind of higher up, you know, just testing the waters, you know. And um, but I remember even at that time, oh, and I had one of my one of my forearms. So you could see one. But I remember just even at that time, like people for those just few tattoos I had, people would just stare at me. Um, and it was like really strange. I remember I went to my cousin, Chad, from Wisconsin, he, from Green Bay. He came to visit. He had to do something downtown for his work. And I, I took him downtown to a, you know, traditional deep dish Chicago pizza place. I think it was Pizza Uno or something like that. And um, I remember it was I was wearing a white T-shirt and my tattoos looked really, you know, really dark. They're pretty fresh. And I remember how awkward it was in this restaurant where everyone is just staring at me. And, I, and at that time, too, I know when you're downtown Chicago, it's mostly students um, or people that work downtown or tourists. Like people in Chicago aren't hanging out downtown, like not really, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I, it was a bunch of tourists at a pizza place just like staring at me for the, for the couple tattoos I had. Um, and I just remember like just, the, I mean, a short matter of time, like maybe, maybe five years or so passed before I started, um, or maybe a little bit more. I can't remember exactly because I, I think I started getting my, my first sleeve done at, at Deluxe around 2007 um but it's it was interesting how from that for my, for my first tattoos until that point how much things have changed in chicago because you know by that point now you're seeing police officers with full sleeves yeah and you're seeing like you know paramedics and you're seeing business people and um and it's just strange how much our culture has changed in such a short amount of time but so, let me explain this every time there's any significant leap in the evolution of tattooing, it has to do with media. And I say this, but this is why. Mm. When you see your Tim Kern, your Kim size, your me, 
people that come from this generation of tattooing that are around the same age, yeah, that all happened because of one thing, the growth of the tattoo magazine industry. Because here mm. we were, all of us, you know, this age group of this generation yeah. who are artists, didn't have an outlet for it. Um, maybe we were punk rock, maybe we were into alternative, you know, music or something and saw people with tattoos. And here comes these tattoo magazines. Now, in these magazines at that time period in the early 90s, 70 to 8 percent would be considered crap. 70 to 80 percent was stuff that was poorly illustrated. The people that did the tattoos may have executed them well, but there was a lot of people in the field at that time that were not really great artists. Now, here were your first crop of great artists that came along at that time. Your Guy Aitchison's, your Aaron Kane's, you know, your Marcus Pacheco's. And at that time, what they're doing was considered mind-blowing because it was illustrated well mm. and using this craft of tattooing to do these tattoos that, you know, the other people weren't doing at that time. Now, if we go back now and look at those tattoos, knowing the way tattoos look now, like if they started now doing what they did then, <laughs> there would be nobody because yeah. the work wasn't that great compared to what's happening now. But at that time, it was do it was mind blowing because they were doing art with tattooing. Yeah. So here comes a whole new crop of people like the people I mentioned that see this stuff. And we see people like them doing stuff that looks good and blowing away these people, the 80% that are mediocrity. And that makes us be like, Hey, I want to get into that. I want to do that. You know what I mean? And I could do that. I want, you know, that looks awesome. Great opportunities. And that's what draws us into it. Now, your next phase, the TV shows, same thing. You've got tons of great people doing great work. The TV shows come out, expose a lot more people to tattooing and all this. Yeah. They start looking, and there's a whole new crop of artists there that see it and say the same thing, and they jump in. Then you have Instagram. Every time you have one of these developments, you're bringing in an exponential amount of new talent. Hmm. There, listen. There's a convention in the suburbs of Chicago. This convention that was going on pre-COVID, now it probably won't be the same. Jason, this thing would have a thousand tables, a thousand booths with tattooers. So maybe 2,000, 2,500 tattooers in one convention. Jason, when I started tattooing, there wasn't that many people tattooing in the whole country. Yeah, that's crazy. And now yeah. you have one convention in Chicago with that many people tattooing at it. And that's just the convention. That's not everyone tattooing in America. Yeah. So think about that. In a period of less than 30 years, tattooing has grown so exponentially, it's mind blowing, you know? It, it is totally crazy. I remember like, like when but, I- But even crazier about it- Yeah. Is think back to what I was saying about the magazines and how maybe 20% of the artists were doing work that you consider good. Oh my God, now you've got a million people doing great work. You've got these black and gray artists coming out of nowhere. You don't, you don't even hear these people tattooing in this city. I mean, I hear about every day. I have no idea who they are. And they do amazing yeah. work. And it, that's it's, what it's so funny, though, because like, so you, you remember like, gosh, it's like six years or so ago now. Um, I, I was on Best Inc. for one episode with Hannah. Um, that was that was funny. That was in L.A. And then because of that, I was asked to be a guest judge on um, Tattoo Titans. And I, they flew me over to, to New York with their filming in Jersey. And I had to spend I was with Ami James. And we for two days, we watched this group of artists and they were the worst tattoo artists I've ever seen in my life. OK, that's not by accident. That's yeah. That's what, that's what I was going to say is it's like there, the episode that I was on. They were specifically going to do like, so it, it's like, it starts out with like, well, like four people, I think. And it's almost like top chef, the way they're doing it or iron chef or whatever. And by the end, there's only one left. And um, the final finale was supposed to be um, because I was the, the judge. It was supposed to be like portraits. They were doing portrait tattoos. And um, by the time I got to that, I remember talking to Ami and being like, dude, I don't think any of these people should ever be tattooing especially portraits on people and he was like yeah it's part of the part of the deal man and yep uh, so i i um 
I remember just before it, I was getting nervous because, I mean, the, the artists that were left were so bad that I was like, there's no way they're going to do a good portrait. And so I but talked. Listen, that's all by design. You know, yeah. they, want, they want good TV. And it is so terrible. <laughs> Dude, it was so bad. That, it was so bad. They would, but, I mean, <laughs> these customers are going to end up with these crappy tattoos. Dude, they but I, never even be in that position. It's because. Oh, it's I easy. know. It was I terrible. I knew a guy that was a crappy tattoo artist. I mean, this guy was bad really nice guy but not a good tattoo artist <laughs> and he gets on the internet and he's all posted how he's awesome i've been selected to be on this show and all this and i had to break the news to him i'm like bro i don't want to be a dick i don't want to ruin your opportunity but i'm trying to you, know, <laughs> you are not being put on this show for good reasons <laughs> yeah. you're gonna be the one they make fun uh, of yeah. and not only that but maybe they might not even do it but then they edit it in a way to make you look like an idiot believe oh, me you're not being put on there for who good who you are or how good you are and I, knowing people that have been on those shows, yeah. when Kim and Hannah first went out to be on LA Inc., I told them straight off the bat, the number one thing you need to know is how to say no. Because these people are not interested in making you good or you know doing a positive thing. They want TV. They want yeah, shop yeah, yeah. TV. And sure enough, it was it was a three-ring circus. You know? Oh yeah, dude. It's it was hilarious. Um I suggested to the people doing the show, like how about we just do black and white? Can we at least do, do, do black and white? Because they're not, these, these people shouldn't be doing portraits. And so they finally agreed to just do black and white for that. Because I thought that's got to be at least, at least that there's a chance it's going to end up being okay. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And uh, this the one guy, he did, um, he did a baby, uh, this guy's daughter. And I swear it looked like Gollum, man. Yeah. Like it was just <laughs> so bad. Um yeah. But it was it was hilarious, uh, you know, to to be a part of it, just to watch it. But but I remember, you know, like, gosh, not even like see where I where I come from in North North Wisconsin. Um, and I'm sure this is like this back then anyways, in most small towns, you know, I always thought tattoos were cool and I always wanted a tattoo, but it was always frowned upon. Um, and, it, and it was it was like that thing like, oh, only bikers and drug dealers and gangbangers get tattoos. And so I do remember when I first got tattooed and I would go visit back home, how, how weird and awkward it was. But let me tell you a funny story. Like maybe six, seven years ago, I went up to my visit my brother up in Leona, Wisconsin. It's by uh, Rhinelander. And they have a prison up there. Um, and really close to where the prison is, is where they had like this cabin that I was staying at. And there's like paths and everything. And I, I went uh, back then I was jogging. <laughs> I should be still doing that, but um, I was wearing a wife beater and that's it. And I got, so I got full sleeves coming out and everything in the neck tattoos. And I don't, I don't think all I'm thinking about is wolves, man, because I keep hearing there's wolves everywhere. That's all I'm focused on. But as I'm jogging, cars are slowing down and people are just looking at me and, um, and it, it keeps happening and people slow down and I'll, I see they're on their phone and, when I get back to my brother's place, my brother's wife said that they got several calls like on the property and they're like, Oh, that's just my, that's, that's Jason. He's my brother or my brother-in-law. They thought a prisoner got it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it was like running around. All these people were like calling in because there's this guy with tattoos running around. So up there, of course, it's just, I just think it's hilarious. Um, but yeah, the culture has changed so much. You know, it's, it's not even, you know, and you know this too, like most people that are, that have tattoos, like I never even think about it. Like I don't even realize until someone comes up to me and says something weird, I'm like, oh yeah, my tattoo. Like, you know, you don't really think about it. It's just a part of you. But it is interesting to to watch that evolution. And it's, it's, it's also kind of neat how you seem to kind of grow with, like you were there at with the whole thing. Like when you started, you kind of started when it was more like, underground stuff. yeah yeah and they kind of just grew with it and developed and um when was it that you actually opened deluxe and and started your own business like how, how did did you just was it something you just thought of like hey i think i should just start my own place or no because it seems like that would be a kind of a it big... was out, it was out, it was out of necessity um I, okay I was, I was 24 working at for a guy who was an old timer who was um who gave me a great opportunity i was uh 
tattooing out of a friend's house and he was upstairs and heard it and came down and liked what he saw and hired me on the spot. I was terrible at the time, but I mean, he gave me the opportunity and I ended up <laughs> in his shop surrounded by people that knew what they were doing and they helped me and yeah. I'm eternally grateful. Half of them are dead now. Um, drugs, you name it. It was, yeah. I was at that time, 2021 thrown into a viper den of, you know, heroin addicts and such. And I had no idea about any of that stuff. And oh, so, man. If I was given the chance to go back in time and have a full ride to Harvard or be in that scenario, I would be in that scenario because you will learn more about life and people being in that scenario than you will ever <laughs> learn in any class. Um, I can imagine, the man. Stories from that place are just insane. Well, anyway, being the only person there who was sober and not um, addicted to drugs and screwed up, uh, he actually made me the manager which was like, I was the guy who'd been tattooing the least amount of time. I was literally like 21, 22, 23. And uh, the accountant at the time was the owner's sponsor in AA and made it very clear to me this was a sinking ship, that his finances were in shambles. And, you know, he's about to lose everything. So having been the manager, I had hired the crew that was currently working and we were all friends and got along. And I said, well, hey, you know, this ends and I open a shop. You guys want to sit together and come work for me? And they said, yes. So that's why I opened the shop because, ah, interesting. Um, you know, I it was working with people I liked. We all got along and, you know, we wanted to keep that energy going. So then I entered the uh, realm of Chicago zoning, which was ridiculous. Um, anything to do with Chicago, you have to call twice and you'll get two different answers. And I had a, a lawyer that was terrible, but good enough to help me get through it had to fight the neighborhood like hell. Um, the alderman was crap, lied to my face. Hmm. I mean, if, if there had just been one thing that hadn't gone the way it went, it wouldn't have happened. But I pushed and pushed and pushed and I got it. So at that time, it was very difficult to get a license for a tattoo shop. Since hmm. then, they've changed it where if it's a specific zoning, you can just go get a license. But back then, there wasn't that. But now, the problem with that zoning is wherever those zonings are, you've got like three shops on two blocks mm. because they don't want to do the work. If you do the work and you do it the way I did, it takes six months of paying rent on space and you know, all this while you're applying. And if you don't get it, you lose it all. So it's a pretty big investment and gamble to try to do it the way I did it. And so eventually it worked out. Man, that sounds crazy. Oh, again, that's, I could fill up a whole episode with that whole experience. That was nuts. Yeah. Jeez, man. <laughs> That's so like, I mean, that had to be like a, a huge, I mean, just the, just the, the responsibility alone of just running a shop and, st but starting one in that way had to be like super overwhelming. Yeah. Like, I mean, I was 25. So, you know, I mean, uh, it was sink or swim, just do it. You know what I mean? And I had the advantage of not having any wife or kids or nothing. It was just me. So, you know, it was good that I uh, was able to do it that young, but yeah. um if you ever have anyone from out of town, well, now COVID again messes it all up. But yeah. if you ever want to see one of the funniest things you can see, go to a, a, a session of Chicago zoning and you will just witness some of those amazing stupidity you've ever witnessed in your life. You know, like what? You don't, what do you mean I can't have a six foot deep in ground pool, you know, that I can just build myself with no permits? Or what do you mean I can't have a pool on my roof? Or what do you yeah. mean I can't add another two floors to my house? You know, these people in zoning are <laughs> the most ridiculous people in the world. <laughs> and um, the judges are just merciless on these people. It's hilarious. So, yeah, dealing with anything in Chicago is politics. Where, where was the first shop at that you had? The, oh, it's the same place, Deluxe. Oh, really? So that's the, oh, the place first one you... I worked at before yeah. Deluxe? Yeah. Oh. No, I mean, like, when you when you first opened up your shop, was it on that, that same spot? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've just expanded. Yeah. Next yeah, yeah. used to be the Elgato Negro. Which yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Was uh, you're a uh, Mexican transvestite bar, which is worse than you imagine, because the transvestites didn't even attempt to be pretty. They were, like, six foot two, <laughs> you know... You know, eight o'clock shadow, yeah. you know, bad, bad, bad. And I, we have witnessed them get into it with, you know, customers being as close as we are to Wrigley Field. 
you would get some drunk Cub fans that would wander in there, and then they'd be in front slugging it out with these transvestites in front of the shop, you know? Yeah. So it was a pretty brutal place. Um, but they ended up getting shut down because the owner got busted bringing cocaine back from Mexico, lost their license. We expanded in and took over the space. So now yeah. we're, you know, we got that space too. That's awesome. So how's it been throughout with, with all this crap going on? I mean, like, I know you guys had to shut down for quite a long time, but like what? what I mean, it- same as everybody, you know, from May to June. Um, I mean, that was a really crappy time because a lot of uncertainty on what was going to happen. And meanwhile, you know, I still have to pay rent. I still have the utilities, a lot of money out the window every day, you know, just for nothing. But um, since it's been great, um, something that a lot of people were very, you know, you shouldn't open it. It's too soon. Listen, we deal with everybody like they have everything because yeah, yep. no one is going to tell you if they don't know they have something. So you have to assume everybody has everything. And so for over 20 years, we've been open. This is how we have lived. We've yeah. already lived like this for 20 plus years. So to us, this is nothing new, you know, and more so I've always held that, Hey, guess what? If you're sick, don't come to work. <laughs> I don't want you here. Yeah. And we've always been like that. So we have had a couple <laughs> of people that work for me that have gotten COVID and, you know, if when as soon as they start feeling any kind of symptoms, just stay home. Just yeah. stay home. Same with customers. If they called and were like, ever, not even with COVID before that, they're like, oh, yeah, I have an appointment, but I kind of feel, like, stay home. Don't yeah. even worry about it. We'll reschedule you. We've always maintained that. Oh, yeah. Now, you guys have always been, like, super super clean about it. I mean, I remember, like, someone, like, leans on the counter and people are like, hey, don't touch the counter. You know, like, <laughs> it's like, it's pretty Well, funny. you do what you can, you know, it's yeah. common sense. But I mean, obviously, if you're dealing with, um, you know, puncturing someone's skin and exposing, you know, it's you want it to be the cleanest place ever. You know, it's like I remember being in a bar um, and uh, some guy just came out from getting tattooed and he was like, like leaning on the bar and everything and. I remember just thinking like, dude, what are you, cause he, he told me, he goes, you know, cause I love like when, when someone sees you and, and they have tattoos, they all of a sudden think that you're bros, you know, because yeah. you both have tattoos. Like, yo bro, check out the sink I just got. It's like, I was like, why are you leaning on the bar, man? <laughs> you're yeah. going to get an infection. It's going to be nasty. It's so funny. Yeah. People are disgusting. And you know, <laughs> what we know going to like the dentist's office, the doctor's yeah. office. Oh my god i watch these people with gloves on put their hands in people's mouths and then go handle handles on open drawers and do all this with the same glove on and you're just like you're cross contaminating everything and then okay <laughs> yeah you see it a lot oh man so all you could do is just you know be as cautious as you can be yeah um, the first i'll never forget the first time i tattooed somebody that straight up told me i have aids i have hiv yeah i was like you know no problem. We treat everybody like they have everything. I have gloves, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Jason, that first drop of blood, dude. Woo! <laughs> I was yeah. like, good stuff. <laughs> you know? I was like, like especially back like, then. Like, yeah. Back yeah. then, it was like a death sentence. But I actually still tattoo that guy. Yeah. And he brings his sister, and he's still around. I've been having a tattoo relationship with this guy for over 20 years. Yeah. But at that time, I mean, I was very young and Oh my God. Yeah. It was scary as hell. But now it's like, yeah, you treat everybody like you have everything. That's crazy, man. So what, what, what kind of stuff you've been working on? Like when, when, so wait, when you, you said that you guys were only closed down from May to June. It was March, March, March to June June 3rd. And then, wow. You see, you guys actually were opened up pretty soon then. Well, the thing that sucks is the, um, the suburbs were allowed to open to go to stage whatever it is three but lightfoot kept the city closed down until june 3rd and it was very strange because that's when all the shit hit the fan downtown yeah and um it was crazy i mean i live not far yeah. from downtown and i mean it was i've never i could never imagine the city being as nuts as it was i mean this cars flying up and down the street shooting all day long and police sirens all day long it was insane and, and she said, we're going to open June 3rd, which is a Tuesday. 
And with all the insanity, we just assumed there was no way it was going to happen because the city is going nuts. And then uh, he's like, no, June 3rd. And then it all stopped. And we opened June 3rd. And that's, I think that's a little strange that everything, like chaos doesn't just stop like that. So yeah. I think there's a very controlled element to all of it. Uh, police officers, I know that have arrested people during that time, said that people would tell them we were paid a hundred bucks to do this. We were told our bail would be paid. People were here from out of state doing crazy stuff. So, I mean, I don't know if you want to go down that road, but it is definitely more to it. <laughs> yeah, that. I don't mind, man. No, that's yeah. that, it is crazy. I mean, the whole thing seems super surreal. Well, um, that you know, chaos would be allowed to happen until a certain point, and then it would be turned off. And you turn off the spigot. I can't. Yeah. Chaos doesn't work like that. You can't yeah. bottle chaos. Once you let it out, the genie out of the bottle. That's it. And I mean, Jason, it was chaos. You know, we had, I live right off Western Avenue. We had shootings going on during the daytime. We had car chases, crashes. I mean, it was mayhem. And for it all just to go back to normal, like overnight, was just like, that doesn't make any sense. Not at all. <laughs> that is totally insane. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, it's really weird, man. Um, <sighs> you know, when Lightfoot, our mayor, you know, Trump wanted to send in the National Guard and she wouldn't have it. But now the Chauvin verdict that just happened, her and the governor had the National Guard ready to go. So what does that say? You know, I mean, politics took place, took, you know, first place before public safety. You know, I mean, like she was wasn't willing to get the National Guard out here to help us Chicagoans and keep us safe because she didn't want to give Trump that, you know, you, you know, yes, we'll take your help. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. She'll put, our, she'll put the Chicagoans safety to the side because politics comes first. But now that Trump's not in the picture, oh, yeah, let's bring in the National Guard. No problem at all. Yeah, I've noticed that quite a bit, actually. So it's pathetic that, you know, uh, politics allows that to come in the way of public safety. It's terrible. Yeah. No, it's, 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 this whole thing has been just, I remember like during that whole, that whole, whole, when downtown was going crazy, um, I never went the downtown. Whole city. The whole city was going crazy. Well, I was just going to say, like, I never went downtown. I saw, like, videos, and I was like, it was unreal what, what the footage looked like. But then I'm up here in Rogers Park, and there was, like, the same kind of things, like, just nonstop shootings and f- fires and ambulances and sirens and all everything was all day. boarded all up. All day and all night. Yeah. I mean, if your viewers don't know because they don't live here. I mean, it was all day and all night. It did not stop yeah. for days. Well, I, I joke around. I've joked around on the podcast about this, but I went. One of the first things I did is I went to the Target near me and I bought a metal baseball bat. Yeah, and I, I have Absolutely. it by my front door. I was like, you know, I'm. I don't. I don't have a gun or anything like that. I don't like you know. But I'm like, I need some. I was like, I was feeling that concern. Like, I need something. Oh, if yeah. someone decides that they're gonna come and mess with my house. And so I had that sitting right there. My wife thought I was a little crazy, but I was like, dude, I will total. I'm this is, you know, just in case, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, it's like, it, it was, it was, it was like during all those, ri- the, the, the rioting and everything going on. Um, and I had gone to, um, I kept hearing warnings about things like, you know, you, you know, the, the, the you know, there's not going to be anything left in the stores and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And so I had I wasn't too worried about that. I thought people were over exaggerating. I went to three different stores to try to get stuff and shelves were empty everywhere. Not, yeah. not even like, like beans and rice and like stuff like it's just all gone. And uh, I walked, I walked from across the street from jewel to target and bought a baseball bat. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, at least I got some, I got a little insurance here. Um, and it was really funny. Cause I, 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 that's all I bought. I didn't, I didn't get anything else in target. I'm standing in line holding a baseball bat and this dude looks at me and I, I just told him, I said, I don't even play baseball. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was wild. You know, I listen to enough, um, conspiracy, paranoia, whatever podcasts that I took it seriously. And I was ready. You know, we had our fridge stocked up. I was all stocked up and ready. So we didn't yeah. have to worry about that stuff. And we have a lot of good neighbors around here. So yeah. we're open when it comes to that, but it was crazy. Yeah. So, but I mean, again, I think that that was for a function, you know what I mean? It was definitely engineered to allow to be that crazy. 
And I don't think you're going to see it again because I think now it's served its function. Hmm. You know, that's so crazy, I mean, man. Like, yeah. Well, yeah, it's a crazy time. For yeah, it's sure. de- it definitely is, man. Have you noticed any, like you said that it's fine now that you're back at work and everything. Um, people are, when they would just start, people just started coming back like no problem after everything. Oh, people were chomping at the bit. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, because everyone's getting paid to sit home. So, now they have, they're not commuting. They're not spending half their day on a train or a bus. They're not in an office. Everything's on Zoom. They're just sitting around the house with this money burning a hole in their pocket, especially hmm. when those checks would come out. You know, it would be crazy. Like when we first opened back up, that's when the, you know, the big checks were first hitting. And yeah, it was nuts. So yeah, we, we are extremely busy right now. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Do you, now, as an artist and someone who, Um, you know, you've been tattooing for a long time and you're the boss, you know, you got to take care of all the rest of the artists as well. Right. You know, you got to make sure, but I mean, the way, the way that you set it up, um, at at the shop, you're not, I've never felt like you, I mean, you run the shop, but it's not like, you know, everyone kind of works for themselves. Right. They kind of have like their own, uh, we're we're a very good community. We all have good communication. We would never have someone work there that people did not want there because yeah. I mean that just creates resentment you know having that black cloud in the shop you know bringing everybody else down I, I can't have that and uh, I, I love and trust everyone that works for me I don't have to worry about anything if I go out of town I'm not going to worry about it because I know that these people are not dipshits and they're not you know yeah. immature and I've worked at shots with those people and <laughs> you know, you don't want that environment. I'd rather have less people working for me, but everyone that works for me is 100% than pack every booth with people that are just jack offs, yeah. that don't respect their opportunities, that don't respect their customers, you know? And if anyone does do anything like that, they're gonna hear it from everybody in the shop. Oh you yeah, know? yeah. <laughs> we have pretty good communication, so no. I mean, I've, I had a guy a while back, a couple of years ago, who hit me up, did really nice work. And the place he worked at was closed on Sundays. And he wanted to pay me some insane amount to do his appointments out of my shop on Sundays. Mm. And I was like, whoa, that's a lot of money just so he could have somewhere to do his work. And um, we needed somebody that did black and gray work like him. So I ended up hiring him. And um, yeah, he was a, he was a total POS. Um, he would charge people a $200 fee to book with him and draw which is like, we don't charge people to do their drawing. Cause I mean, I think that's a bad way to do business because I want you to get what you want to get. Uh, if you, I do a drawing and you look at it and it's not what you want, then I'm going to redraw it, but I'm going to do it until it's what you want. Cause I want you to be happy. Now, if you put a price tag on that, people are going to compromise because they don't want to keep paying money for a drawing. You know what I'm saying? So they're yeah, not yeah. going to pay that money. So they'll end up settling for something. So they don't pay that money. That's, that's, a terrible way to do business um then this guy would sit there and he'd tattoo for five or ten minutes and then he'd take a break and he'd tattoo for 20 minutes and take a break and he'd like go in the back of the shop and pace around basically people would be there for like four hours and get like this much work done and he'd charge them some astronomical amount and they would pay it because they didn't know any better um it was wow. and and yes the guy's making me money and he asked, he does nice work, but I could not stand his way he treated customers. And um, I, it was like a scam. It was a terrible scam he was pulling. And I fired him. I'm like, I can't have this associated with my business. There's yeah. no way, you know, because all these people spend so much time of their life in my business, you know, building the reputation, building, you know, something up to have some retard come in there and just ruin it for everybody no i'm not gonna have it you know um i i mean i respect so much that these people have kids have families have lives and that they're in my business working their butts off you know to make the name of the business really good so yeah no i would never i would never take that for granted and i mean i am always telling these people travel take time off if you need to take a week off to sit home, and watch, you know, Jeopardy and get your mind in order, do it. 
You know, I don't ever want anybody to not live their life so they can work and, you know, because they feel like they have to be at work. No, man, life's, you know, you got to do it while you can. And before COVID, I would try to get, you know, I did one young guy working for me and I'm like, get the fuck out of here, man. Go travel, go work, go see some different countries, go work at some different shops, you know, because he had <laughs> such a limited scope. He didn't really, he's never really been abroad and worked. He's never worked at conventions. And I wanted them to, you know what I mean? It's, it's not all about, you know, I need a new Corvette or I want to get rich. I don't give a shit. You know, I want these people to have good lives and have, you know, a really rich understanding of what's out there. So I stress these guys all the time, you know, do it. Whatever it is you want to do, do it. Now for your people secure, your space is secure, you know, don't worry about it. Now for people listening to this that don't know, you know, much about tattooing or how things work. Um, what, what does it take for someone that's wanting to learn how to tattoo? Like when they come in, cause you do, I mean, like, do you, do you ever take on apprentices yeah. and like do that kind of stuff or. I barely have time to take a shit, let alone teach an apprentice. <laughs> so um, basically when someone, when someone you, you, you're basically hiring, I mean, you guys, you guys have like the best tattoo artists there. I mean, so I, I already I kind of knew the answer to that before I asked, I was just curious, but like, what would you say to someone who wants to get into it? It's number like one is you got to be bad ass. You have to be on top of your game. You have to want to put the work in and show that you put the work in to be an awesome artist to start. Um, no one's like a lot of people that do apprenticeships do it for money. So they're going to charge you five grand, six grand, maybe more in cash with no guarantee that you will learn or get anywhere with it. So it's, mm. it's kind of a scam because there's no, you don't have any rights. You should, if you're going to give someone that much money to teach you, you should have a list of demands that you expect in return. And you never hear that. All you hear is, you know, uh, two of the people that work for me started out at the same shop where you would pay thousands of dollars for an apprenticeship. And they did. And they had to scrub toilets and they had to do all kind of, you know, crap you know, stupid stuff they shouldn't have to do because they basically want you to quit. So you can get another person in there, get another five grand. You know what I'm saying? It's a business. It's terrible. Um, oh my God. That's why I'm saying if you're a good artist and you do great work, they're going to see you as an asset and they're going to want to help you learn to tattoo so they can profit off you and have you in their business. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So if you come in a place and you're an awesome artist, you want to learn to tattoo, they're going to be like, yeah, let's turn you into a tattoo artist. Maybe you can work here and, you know, help the shop, build the reputation, whatever. So there's that. I think that, you know, there's a lot of people that say they want to be a tattoo artist and then you see the art they're doing and it's like, really? This is how bad you want it? Because this doesn't look like you want it too bad. This looks <laughs> like you tried, it, you tried to draw some stuff you saw in a magazine or something. Did you try? I mean, me and you both know the amount of work it takes to really try. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you can recognize it. I'm sure you see people all the time. They're like, hey, Jason, here's my art. And you're like, "Ooh, really? I'm sure your mom told you you're good, but I got something <laughs> to tell you. You know? <laughs> and um, I think that's the problem in the everybody gets a trophy world is that people yeah. don't get what work is. Um, honestly, I didn't. I mean, honestly, I look back at where I was when I started and I, I was not good. You know, I had, I had this good enough to get my foot in the door, but not having somebody in your life to be honest with you and tell you that you need to work harder, that that sucks. I'm going to give you a good critique. Um, I was lucky when I started tattooing, one of the first people I met, I was exposed to was Guy Aitchison and Guy is still one of the top tattooists in the universe. He's amazing. And, um, through mutual friends, I met him and he was extremely kind to me. He gave me great opportunities. I worked for him for a little bit when I was getting my shop open. Um, he tattooed me, but he would give me critiques on my work. And he was not an asshole. He was just very honest about everything, which was great because it, was, it wasn't just, to be honest and good at critiquing, you have to know how to pinpoint. If you can pinpoint something to somebody and say, you know, this little one thing will help you if you do this, that helps. When you tell somebody, ah, that looks like crap, that doesn't help. You know what I mean? Or you're really vague. Yeah. Guy was great at pinpointing. Guy was great at being able to pinpoint little things that could really make a difference. 
Um, <laughs> that just cracks so, me up. I do I do a lot of critiques uh, for students, and it just cracks me up to think just how you said that. I can I can just imagine like someone handing in something, go yeah, that doesn't look good, yeah. <laughs> and that's just all you say. Yeah, no, you. Oh, for there sure, are people. You yeah, have to. I've, seen it. I've witnessed it. You know, yeah. where they're very vague and they can't really pinpoint why it doesn't look good, or people that are so butthurt at that first comment that everything else is they're not even hearing it. All they're hearing yeah. is wow because they can't believe that their ego can't believe that this guy doesn't think their work is great you know um you know the one of the most important things i ever learned in my life was learning how to shut the fuck up and listen yeah. and i learned it when i was getting my business open because there was a lot on the line and i'm dealing with the city of chicago I'm dealing with people that are telling me two different things. So like I said, you call one time, you get told one thing. You call another time, it's another thing. The lawyer I had was not a zoning lawyer. He was referred by a friend. He should have said, hey, I'm not a zoning lawyer. But he was, I don't know what his deal was. Yeah. But he, he wasn't, I, he was not what got me over the edge. What got me over the edge was learning how to really listen and really see what was happening and really know when to who to believe and what to believe but that carries on to everything is learning how to hear it you know people have so much in their ego yeah. built up and pre-existing judgments in their head about everything that they just don't oh, yeah. hear it but it's right there um another one i read in a book a couple of years ago that was great was um if you can't see the lesson you're not ready to learn it hmm. meaning that you know it's right there yeah. You know, whenever you want to learn it, whenever you want to be a better person, a stronger person, a better artist, whatever you want to be better at, everything you want to know is right there. It's yeah. just you have to turn that ego off and you got to learn how to let it come in. And, you know, it's so easy when you let it be. So these people that want a tattoo, do they really? Because you see this stuff and you're just like, no, you don't really want a tattoo. Yeah. No, it's, I mean, it's hard. It's the same thing with illustration. I mean, and basically with any kind of art form, I think, I mean, you, you want it bad enough and you have to like, there, there's, there's so many artists out there that, like you said, they don't know how to shut the fuck up and they don't also, they don't know how to um, basically look at themselves in the mirror in an honest way, you know, be, you know, like they can't handle, like I'm, I'm working on something right now that um, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a cool project. It's for DC comics and the you know i spent two days they wanted a full color sketch um and i went a little overboard with my sketch um i got carried away and i and i you know they really loved it they were like the the you know um they're kind of blown away they couldn't believe how much you're like wow but they're like man you we just wanted like to, to see like a color palette because even though we like this drawing the, the characters we we really want this and this and there this and this and all this stuff and and i was like oh it's no problem you know like I, but i i can i know there's a lot of artists that would hand in something like this and be like it's it's practically a finished piece um but i gotta start almost all over again you know that's just part of it and part of it was that like i said i got carried away because i got really excited about it and was having fun um and um but you know if you're not willing to, to basically be, be able to be okay and understand that you're doing something for them. Like this is their thing. And my job is to give them the best thing that they want. You know, it's the same thing. Like I, I totally get what you're saying with the tattoos. It's like, it does seem a little bit strange. Um, like I, I can't imagine I've, I've never had that with you guys, but like going in and, you know, checking out um, the, the drawing that I'm going to get tattooed on myself and wanting a couple changes, but then having to ch charge for all those you know at just in the drawing phase would just be a, a big turnoff in a way because you know like, I, it's not right it's not what i was there's, wanting there's a lot of people that just um they they're new to it and they don't understand that yeah they if you don't know you think that's the way things work but i do i do got to say like i can understand it in one aspect because as an illustrator you know depending on what kind of job i'm working on there are times where you know we work out a deal where I get, I do get paid for the sketch phase because it, the amount of time that's going to go into that. Um, Cause you know, it's, I'm spending like a day working on drawings, but for the most part, even as, as with my work, you know, I get paid one fee 
for the whole project and that that includes the sketch you know yeah. that's that's just part of it um so yeah it's interesting but you know what i mean there's there are people that are um really busy successful tattoo artists that do charge that drawing fee yeah. and you know what oh, if um if they're there yeah if yeah. that works if that works for them and their customers and them have this agreement and it works for them hey good do it i just don't like that person yeah i don't think that's the right idea there's a lot of stuff you know and that's the other thing with tattooing a big turn that's happened in the last few years is there's these people now doing tattoos that a lot of people that have been tattooing for years look at and say what that's garbage how is this person busy sometimes it's really simple stuff or real sloppy looking people want it so you know in my eyes i say hey if somebody wants it that makes it valid you know um but i get it on me no do i think it's awesome <laughs> no but i wouldn't knock it as invalid because obviously people want it yeah you know so the consumer is going to dictate you know the market yeah um <laughs> this reminds me of <laughs> it's funny that 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 same show that i was on uh the tattoo titans um there was this woman one of the contestants with this woman, she said that she she's owned her own shop for 20 years or something like that. And she came walking out all like, you know, really excited to be there and everything. And she was, she was uh, really flashing her stuff, you know, and the first, um, I guess, I don't even want to call it like level or whatever. They were given a, like an item and they had to look at the item and, um, and there, were, there was a small description of what the person that was coming in wanted to get tattooed. And hers was this book. And she had the actual book. Like, in, she can look at it. Yeah. It's like there. And also, they have access to Google. So they can, like, look up, like, images and different things. And during so after they give out the what what whatever the assignment is or whatever the, the whatever you want to call it the whatever assignment works i guess we all go back into this room and there's like a tv screen and we're there's a camera guy going around filming and we're watching and i'm watching um as she's tattooing this person and i'm just like the whole time like oh no oh no like this is so crazy and when it got, when it got time to where we had to sit up at our judge tables and they went through and we had to look at each person's thing and talk to them. I, I want to try to find this. I bet you I can find this online. It, it, it's the worst tattoo I've ever seen it, probably ever. And I'm sure you've seen so many more, but the funniest thing about this tattoo is when it got like, the, like they're like Ami is like this tattoo artist. Everyone knows who he is. And he's like, I'm just like this guest guy, this illustrator. And I remember feeling like so awkward and like, like, what do I say? So when it comes to my turn, first of all, Ami was just like, like, man, that's just not a good tattoo. And you, you didn't, you just, you didn't like, you didn't put the effort in and all this kind of stuff. And when it got to me, I, I just said, you know, I'm really, I'm going to be honest. I really, I'm really confused here because you had the book, the actual book. And so it, 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 like you, you, there's no excuses for how terrible this looks. Also, you could have Googled things. You could have, you, you, you know, there, there was a lot of things here for you to work with, but I said, I just told her, I said, listen, I'm an illustrator. I've been doing this for a long time. And when I get asked to paint something for a magazine, um, it doesn't matter what magazine it is, but if it's a, if it's a bigger magazine that I know a lot more people, there's a, there's even more pressure because I know more people are going to see it. And, really i just want to do the best job possible um so that i get more work get more opportunities and i don't want to let my clients down and this is in print okay and yeah. you know people are going to see it maybe it'll be online forever who knows but it's in print what you're doing is on someone's body forever and, and i said i've never even held a tattoo gun i've never done a tattoo in my life before and i promise you i could do a better tattoo than that and i said I said, I don't know what you're doing here and what's going on. Cause this is absolutely the worst tattoo. And she's like, Oh, you could do a better tattoo. And I go, yeah, let me explain why. And I said, because before I would ever commit, I might have the shakiest lines. I might go too deep 
or something. I might, I might even, I mean, there's whatever I'm sure that happens when people are just starting. I'm sure I would make those mistakes, but before I would ever even commit to touching someone's skin, my design would have been good. I would have had a good design. Your what you did, what you decided to transfer onto that person's back was a, I mean, was a failure before even it even started. It was, uh, I mean, it you was know, but another part of that though, is this is what you learn over the years. It takes two to tango. And that guy saw the design and approved it. Um, oh my I gosh. There's no way. Oh, no, 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 they didn't. No, no, actually. No, that's not how they did this. That's not how they were doing it. That's it was terrible. Though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Close, but the thing is, we do get <laughs> like that. Yeah. That have these tattoos that are terrible. It was on his and shoulder. He didn't see it at all. No, usually guys, you know, they'll see the design before they do it. Oh, uh, maybe excuse about why they got it or why. That's probably true, it. actually. But but still, I just I just I'm, I just think it's a yeah. funny thing because, um, you know, that night, w- m- my wife and I go back to the hotel they put us in, and I have to come back the next day, and she got kicked off, and I'm at I'm at the hotel. That I'm staying at, at this restaurant and we're getting dinner and that lady comes walking in <laughs> and she starts like like yelling at me and saying things to me and everything and uh, I remember I had to talk to the, the TV producers and stuff you like put us in the same hotel as the people are on the show that's so weird and awkward like I don't want to run into them like yeah. what doing this? I mean I literally just got done like in, <laughs> just I mean I kind of, it was kind of a funny thing because I just felt like, you know, I'm on this show and it's supposed to be entertaining, but at the same time, I want to be brutally honest because I have friends and fans that are going to watch this. I I want them to see like, yeah, Jason just told them how it is. That's how, that's how he says things to his students. And and that lady, that lady could come away from that one or two ways. I mean, she could obviously, that might be a slap of reality if you need it. and, And maybe you'll hear from her in a year, but thank you. Because now I've worked harder and this is what I'm doing. That would be nice. Uh, I've had people, I know <laughs> tattoo artists that I had that type of encounter with. Yeah. Where when I first met them, they were starting and they showed me their work and I would tell them something they didn't want to hear. Yeah. But then later I'll run into them and they'll be like, you know, man, you were right. And, you know, thank you because it made me want to work harder. So there is those people. Yeah. But there's also the lazy POSs that are going to rationalize in their head why you know you were wrong and you're a jerk and keep doing bad work you <laughs> well know? i think it's they, also like there. i think it's also like what you said too is it you know when when i was asked to to be on that thing i didn't know anything about it i i, I realized when i was there that it was a gimmick and that yeah. like because at first i like i couldn't believe what they were like you know i was assuming that the best of the best were going to be on the show and I couldn't believe, like, I, I was sitting there just nervous the whole time. Like, please do a good tattoo. Please do a good tattoo. Because <laughs> it makes you feel weird. Like, I'm supposed to be judging this stuff now. And I'm like, they're all terrible. We have to choose yeah, the, I, the, be- the best of the worst here. <laughs> like, I hate that I hate that they take tattooing and do that with it. Because yeah, yeah, 90% sure. of America is going to watch that and think that's what tattooing is. That show didn't last, though. They did one season. That was it. Yeah. But still, so, it's done the damage. The damage being the damage is done. People are going to watch yeah. that and think that's dead. Yeah, and that's why. Uh, you know, no, I, I don't. Man. I don't watch any of those shows. You know, my friends. Yeah, me neither. I tried to watch it. You know, support my friends, and I record it. Then I would fast forward through this, the tattoo parts. <laughs> then the episodes would sit on the DVR, and I just like that to them. You know, because I just couldn't stand watching this crap. You know. Dude, but another thing you might want to know, do you know Ami James used to live in Chicago? No, no. Yeah, my friend Gil um, lived in Florida for a while and knew Ami and then moved back here and Ami came with him back here. Mm. And Ami moved here and lived here for a while, worked at Chicago Tattoo Company. And then the first winter, he was like, uh, no, I'm going back to Florida. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he didn't last one winter and he went right yeah. back. No, he, yeah, he, I, met he him, awesome. I knew him and met him when he had lived here originally. Yeah, he was a nice guy. Um, it was funny though when I was on uh, the Best Ink episode. I think Hannah's the one that suggested me to to be a guest on that one, and it, it was funny. They um, I said, "Oh, what do I have to do?" And they're like, "Oh, you just were you know you're just gonna look at people's artwork, and you're gonna give them tips and hints and different things like that, and that's pretty much it." And I'm like, "Oh, okay." Cool. And I was looking at like, "Oh, this is cool. It'll be a good exposure for me as an artist, you know, to be on this show." 
-hmm. And, um, and so they flew me out and I get to the hotel. I'm downtown LA. And that night I, I, I was, I didn't, I'm, I wasn't that familiar with LA, but I mean, I'm downtown by myself in LA. Um, I decided I'm going to walk around and find a place, go get a glass of wine or something. And it was like, night of the living yeah. dead down there yeah, skid row down there yeah. and i was like what the heck is going on so i i i, I just went back to my hotel room um next morning they picked me up and they hand me a script yeah and, and i was like what is this and they're like oh this is this is the things that we want you to say and i was like what and it was really a bunch of dumb things and i was like i would yeah. never say any of this stuff and so when i got there i said listen i'm not comfortable with this like i'm i i'm i can freestyle like you know, like, show me someone's work and I'll talk about their work. But it's not about that. Like, when Kim was on the show, she would tell me how the producer would come up to her while she was having a conversation with a client. You know, she was tattooing and they'd stop it and they'd be like, recording. They'd stop it and say, listen, we want you to have the same conversation, but I want you to say the word hella. Oh, no. She was like, what? <laughs> yeah. Like, the most ridiculous stuff. And yeah. I mean, I know this about these shows. You know, a lot of people don't understand that what goes on <laughs> in the shows, they, they, this, it's absurd. And, you know, they put an earpiece in your ear and they talk to you good. while you're talking. Oh, I believe it. And they tell yeah. you. And if you don't want to do it, guess what? They got 30 people waiting to do it. Yeah. So if you don't want to do it, fine. Call the next guy. And that's how they operate. Well, you know and what they did to me is while, so they, I was, they were, they were doing a, an episode of, like an illustration episode. And so what they did was they gave the artists that they had there, um, like just so, some Ill, white, white sketch pads with color pencils. And they set up a fake car crash when a guy gets out of the car and gets mad and pulls out his gun and starts shooting at another guy. It was like in skid row and they set it up. So when the, when they all come out there, there's like, they witnessed this car accident and it's supposed to be like, yeah, you know, it, they were promoting Improm fast and yeah, they were pr promoting fast and furious or whatever. So then they start working on this. They're, they're, they had to draw what they remember and come up with a cool scene. Um, and that's, you know, and they weren't going to tattoo this. They, this is just an illustration assignment. And I remember when they were doing it, I was talking to them like, this isn't really how illustration works. Like, you know, an illustrator will gather references. You're not giving them any references. They're supposed to just do this from their memory uh you know you should give them some some kind of reference of the car and different things they can look at and they weren't doing any of that and i was like and also these color pencils and paper are really crappy like you know just give them like a regular pencil and but they were going around while i was in this in this room and they were going around filming um the drawings and so th they were saying hey when you see these drawings just talk about what you think and i wasn't being like they couldn't hear me. I was just with the producers and stuff. And so I'd, I'd like say this and that or whatever about this drawing or that one or whatever. And then they, they give me, after I did all of them, they give me an earpiece and they want me, now they want me to walk around and like talk with the, with the different artists. And, and then they go, okay, for this guy, you remember you, you were saying this and this and this. So make sure you say this and this. And I'm like, oh. So like for each one, they like took note of things I said, and then they were like telling me in my ear. <laughs> it was really weird, man. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just very strange. And the funny thing was, is they didn't know that I had tattoos. So when I showed up, and I thought that was like you know an obvious thing, but they're like, oh, well, he has tattoos too. Oh, this makes it even better, you know. <laughs> but they they it's didn't ridiculous. seem they they were like the same film crew for Hell's Kitchen. Cause I remember a bunch yeah. of them were wearing Hell's Kitchen sweatshirts and, um, oh, are you there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My okay. power's going out. Yeah, like ten percent. Uh, oh, okay. Well, we can wrap it up real soon. Anyways, I just th I just think it's kind of a funny, it's an interesting thing because I think the whole tattoo thing. It's I think a lot of people have, even still have a weird perspective and understanding of what it really is. Sometimes one of my best friends is a guy who's like twenty years older than me. My friend Tom, and I'll never forget. He's like. This Ink Masters is so cool. I love the black and gray realism. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about, Tom? What, what, what are you watching? And yeah, yeah. he got on those shows. You That's know? pretty funny. Hilarious. Yeah, so it, it, <laughs> it's good in the way that it's gotten huge amounts of people into the tattoo culture, as you can see by just walking out your door. Yeah. It's everywhere now. And, and the only downside is 
when I go, let's say I got my sleeves when back then in Chicago, there was maybe a dozen, two dozen people with a sleeve tattoo. Yeah, yeah. And you knew, you knew who had them. You knew the tattoos. Everyone knew that stuff. And so if you got your forearm or your hand or you got a big tattoo like that done, it was like a rite of passage. Like you're one of those people. Yeah. Now everybody has a sleeve tattoo. You <laughs> couldn't have, there's no way you could have known that in the nineties or in the eighties or anything. So now when you got that tattoo in the eighties, you did it for a reason to be in a certain context. And now you're stuck in the same context as all these bozos that are getting stuff in their friends' basements when they're 14. Yeah. You're mixing it with them, you know? <laughs> So that's the downside is that, you know, uh, tattooing the what comes along with it has all been dictated by this whole new crop of people. The good thing is, hey, I can go to the beach now with my kids and not get looked like at like I'm a prison, you know, inmate, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So that's good. <laughs> um, the funny thing Zach was telling me was he knows a tattooer from Massachusetts and he was watching some movie that was filmed in a prison supposedly in the 90s. And here's this tattooist is one of the extras. So he talked to that guy and he said like, hey, I saw you in this movie. You want to know why this guy ended up an extra in that movie? Because in the 90s, in the mid 90s, there wasn't enough tattooed people to cast as extras. Mm. There literally was not enough people that were heavily tattooed at that time to film a scene like that. So they had to call tattoo shops to try to find extras to be in these movies. Wow. <laughs> So that wouldn't funny. be a problem nowadays oh no in, so in easy. the 90s that was actually there was actually not that many people that were that tattooed that's Pretty crazy. crazy that yeah. is totally crazy have you been um uh i mean with with running the shop and everything else do you ever have time um just to do your own art ever you know no. what i there's enough there's enough drippy skull drawings in the world <laughs> i don't need to contribute to that pool of drawing <laughs> okay um, yeah uh my outlet is cool i'm a pool player yeah and, uh, my big outlet i love pool and yeah. so i work on my pool game and i work on the discipline and uh i enjoy that thoroughly well, and i do awesome, love man. drawing and i do work on my drawings and try to make them the best i can make them but it comes to drawing like for myself yeah i mean i i've, I've done plenty it's of hard that. it's hard for me to find time for my own stuff yeah i understand yeah yeah it's like especially now like you know i have i have four daughters now so it's yeah. like it's just you know the, the even doing this this podcast is like extra time you know <laughs> the art the art i love to do is um i do silly stuff with my son who's six where we find cardboard in the alley like uh from laundry machines or boxes and I do giant acrylic paints on there with him. We'll paint like from Among Us, the video game he likes, or mm. Godzilla, or Siren Head. So I'll send you a couple of those images. Yeah, so they're fun because I can do those in no time. And they're so fun to do with him. And we cut them out. And he's got these giant cutouts now of all of his favorite characters. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that's so we'll awesome. be driving down the alley and I'll see a refrigerator box or something. Er, hit the brakes, throw it in the car. And on my days off, we'll sit there and just knock these things out. I'll send you some photos. They're really yeah, cool. That's They're awesome, man. That's yeah, awesome. So that's fun. I like doing that because that's very low pressure. Very just fun, you know. That's awesome. Well, I know you, we got to get going. Your phone's gonna die soon. Um, so anyone that if, if you're ever in Chicago, definitely check out Deluxe Tattoo. Um, I like I said, I think I've been going there since like 2007. Um, I don't really have much room left um, in areas <laughs> I want to get tattooed, but, um, but, uh, but yeah, I, you know, you guys are always it, like such a great place. It's, it's so much fun. I always love going there and just like chatting and hanging out and stuff. So thank you so much for joining me for this and, and talking about your stuff, man. Um, anything that uh, like, what, what are you, what, l let me, let me get your links, man. Like what, what's your uh, Instagram and stuff like that. So people can follow. Uh, ben Wa tattoo. I think it's this B E N W A H T A T T O O. And then, um, yeah, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram, all that stuff. Just look them, so, look them up, look them up. Yeah, you'll find me. And then Deluxe <laughs> Tattoo Chicago is the shop. And you can see all my wonderful coworkers and their beautiful work they do. Yeah. And I always tell everybody, always, I always recommend the shop because. The, the, the great thing about it is you've got such a diverse group of artists there like any kind of style that anyone wants there's someone there that can do it yeah you know? that's awesome so cool thanks so much man and um hope you uh 
Gonna have a nice rest of the evening. Maybe play hey, some listen. pool. And, and <laughs> you know, I, I talk about you all the time. You're awesome, and I'm very honored to know you. You know, having known you, like when we first met, I think you're still playing in bands and rocking around. <laughs> and now, you know, if you, you know, you're, you're doing great. You got your family. Um, yeah, your work's awesome. I love seeing it. I love seeing your, what you're doing with yourself. Keep Thanks, it up. Thanks, man. Appreciate it, man. Likewise. No, man. I really do. I mean, you really do amazing work. So don't, you know, <laughs> keep it up. I'm, I'm trying, man. <laughs> you, cool. do. you do. <laughs> I don't take compliments very well. <laughs> well, take it. All right, man. I love you so much, man. Thanks so much for hanging out. And uh, to everyone else, we'll see you next time. All right. Thank you. You want answers?